title of my sermon this morning is what is your life what is your life and i got it there from james 4 what is your life it is even a vapor which appeareth for a little time and then vanish vanisheth away now when you thought about because this is the this is the last sunday of this year right in a couple of days we're going to be celebrating or if you guys celebrate new year's eve and we're going to be going into the new year on january now what went through your mind when you realized the year was over i don't know about you guys but when i think about when the year is over i'm like man that just went so quick the year is just gone again um and i guess the question is do you think this every year every year when you hit new year's eve you think wow some life just the year's just gone it's over before you know it we'll be here again a year later thinking the same thing man a year is just gone it just went so quick and that's why every new year i don't know about you but i'm reminded about how short life is because the year goes so quick but even when you look back in your past you think oh man where did all the years go where did all the time go now do you realize that we've been in this building already one whole year like sometimes when i go soul winning out with lewis i still hear him saying oh we just recently started meeting <laughs> at seaton recreational it's not so recent anymore you know it's been a year now one whole year we've been in this building and how time has flown and i mean even now i mean i'm starting to plan our church's fifth year anniversary five years man i remember when we started this church thinking just getting i remember there was like a three-year requirement for something and i was just thinking oh man that three years it's never gonna come now it's like two years and i'm thinking oh man i gotta do that thing that took three years to wait for and i still haven't got around to doing it but man i'm planning our fifth year anniversary five years our church has been waiting how time flies we must be having fun and who remembers where they were at the turn of the millennium do you remember where you were when uh 1999 ticked over i don't even remember what you were doing i was doing something quite sad actually i was playing card games with my mate in his room on the turn of the millennium i hope you guys were celebrating a bit more than i was but maybe you remember where you were when 1999 ticked over to 2000 do you realize that that was 20 years ago two zero 20 years ago but sometimes you can remember like i i still remember where i was when i heard about the news of 9-11 i don't know if you remember when you heard about the twin towers being crashed into there was some bombshell news on the on the television i remember like my dad was saying oh what's happened he turned the tv on and i remember i remember like walking into his apartment at uh you know in, in east perth and him having the news on saying oh somebody's just flown a plane into the twin towers in the united states i think every, there are certain events in life where you remember where you were but then you reflect on do you know how long ago that was 9 11 i guess they always talk about it 19 years ago 19 years ago those terrorists flew into the towers all of you believe that some people you know was it a missile you know was it you know, a lot of people believe it was an inside job you know tower seven wasn't hit by a building and yet just crumbled like a deck of cards so definitely something dodgy going on there but 19 years ago man i mean when i when elizabeth and i got married and we left the us because elizabeth if you didn't know elizabeth was there her family had moved to the us illegally so when we left the us the way it works is if you overstay once you're 18 years old if you overstay at least uh, if you if you overstay your visa then you're banned from the united states for three years but if you're over 18 and you overstay you stay there illegally for over one year you're banned from the US, united states is 10 years 10 years what, is, what does that mean that ban that means you can't enter back in because to enter through the us you need to have a tourist visa so they don't let you apply for a tourist visa and obviously you can't get a working visa and all that stuff 10 year ban now i remember when we were leaving the united states i was just thinking oh 10 years a whole decade she's banned from the us but then 10 years later is going to be next year <laughs> that's how quick 
Time has gone, and uh, even when we left, I mean, we had one child. I remember when we got married, I mean, I couldn't even imagine having one child. And here we are, almost about to have our sixth child, 10 years later. I mean, life just flies. And, uh, you know, our, our oldest son, I mean, you know, he's starting to be a little man. He's starting to have his own attitude, think for himself. You know, conversations get a little bit more interesting now. But yeah, man, how, how short is life? How quick does time go? I saw a meme on Facebook recently. You know, in a couple of days, you'll realize that the 1990s was 30 years ago. <laughs> as you, if you grew up as a 90s kid, man, the 1990s, 1999, 20 years ago, 1990s was 30 years ago. Wow, how short is life? So that's my first point, that life is short. If you just reflect in your own life, and even today as we think about it, we think, man, where has our life gone? It just goes so quick. You get to the end of the year, we have the same thought every year. I don't know about you guys, I have the same thought at the end of every year. Man, the year is over already. James 4, go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue their year and buy and sell and get gain. So what is he talking about here in James 4? These are people that are boasting about what their, their future plans, right? what they're going to do, what they're going to accomplish in the future, rather than worrying first and foremost, what are you doing today? What are you going to do today for the Lord? Rather than thinking, hey, I'm doing all these things in the future. I'm gonna, this is what I plan to do when I've done this. I'm going to do all this. Why? Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. Right? You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. For what is your life? Look how the Bible describes our life. It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Your life is a vapor. Have you ever just stared at the kettle boiling? Or have you ever just stared at the pot boiling and seen the vapor just rise and it just disappears immediately? This is how God is describing our life. God describes our life and says, hey, your life in the perspective of eternity is so short that we don't want to waste it. Right? We don't want to boast about, hey, all these great things we're going to do down the track. Don't live in tomorrow. You need to make sure you're doing something today. What are you doing today to accomplish those things tomorrow? Not just, hey, all these things in the future without any plans. That appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. So our life is but a vapor. And it's over so quickly. So what are we going to do with our lives? Now when we think about a vapor, like I said, it's so quick. How much time do you really have in life? And uh, some of us are already in, in midway through our life. How much time do we really have left? Well, you know the Bible, it's interesting, the Bible actually gives us an average lifespan in Psalm 90 verse 10. Look what it says here. The days of our years are three score years and ten. So what is a score? A score is 20. So three score is 60 and 10. That makes 70. And if by reason of strength they be four score. So he's saying your average life is 70 years. And if you are a bit healthier, 80 years is your average life. Right? Average. Obviously some people live more, some people live less. Yet is their strength labor and sorrow for it is soon cut off. And we fly away. So at the most, let's say 90, 100 years, I looked up some charts online. I got these charts from this, from this website called Wait But Why. But a lot of people make charts like this just to put in perspective how brief our life is. Because sometimes when you draw it out, it just makes you realize, wow, this is how short life is. So this is somebody that has drawn a diagram that represents a 90-year human life. Right, so we talked about 70, 80 average lifespan. But let's say we represented a 90-year life. One block for every year. Each row, he's got one, is a decade. And then the last one is when you turn 90. So you can think about where you are in here. If you had 90 counters and every year you lost one, do you, you think if you thought of your life this way, you changed your perspective, you'd use your life, you'd use your time a little bit wiser? 
Because we think we have all the time in the world, don't we? But if we look at it in years, I mean, that's, that's a very small number, right? That's very easy to count from one time. And that's if you live that long, right? That's most of us are already, you know, I mean, I'm here, I've already used my first three rows. Some of us are a little bit later on in life. How many years do we really have left? Now here's a chart that shows a 90 year human life in months. So a little bit more. So birth is a 30th birthday. I think it's very interesting to picture things this way. So each row is 36 months, three years. 60th birthday, and here's when you turn 90, right? Your 90th birthday. And here, I think this was very interesting. But this is a 90 year human life in weeks. So sometimes when we think about the years in our life, they're very finite. But when we think about the weeks in our life, we think the weeks in our life are countless. Like there's just so many weeks in our life. But here are all the weeks in somebody who lives to the age of 90. So if you just reflect on that, that is a very finite amount. You can count that. You know, it's countable. But that's all you have. And that's if you live to the age of 90. So how many boxes do you have left? Because if you think about it, every time you come to church on Sunday, if you come to church on Sunday, one of these boxes gets ticked off. Every week, another one gets ticked off. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. Every week, one gets ticked off. One of it vanishes, and you'll never get it back. How many weeks do you have left? And when you think of life in terms of years, how many years do you have left? Let's say if you live to 90, well, let's say you live to 80. I'm about 30 years old right now. 50 years, that means there's 50 New Year's celebrations left. Five zero. And it's all gone. Now here's interesting, he's kind of colored it to, to give like, you know, standard life cycles of a, of a typical American. So you can see here, that's your early years, elementary school, we would call primary school, right? Primary school, and you got middle school and high school. We sort of bunch those together, lower school, upper school. University, it's college. And then graduate school and career. So this is your career, so this is what people do to work. And these might be your retirement years. And that's if they put people retiring <laughs> at 60, 63. Well, most people want to retire now at 65 or 70, right? It's your life. So where are you in this, in this life? These are different areas. I didn't show all the charts. He showed some charts where, you know, he put dates about where certain famous people died, where they ended their life. And it's actually quite sad to see, you know, this is a 90 year life. And yet some of the famous people, they died in their 40s, died in their 30s, died in their 50s. They didn't even get to use up all these squares in their life. So like I said, this chart shows you a full 90 year life. Now where are you at in this 90 year life and how much do you even have left of this 90 year life? Are you gonna get it all? What if you go earlier? What if you don't live to 90 years old? Luke 12, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. So you see here, we're talking about what is your life? Hey, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. You see how the Bible, or Jesus here, is warning us of covetousness. And in the day and age we live in, it's very easy to fall into this trap, isn't it? To think that my life is accomplished because of what I have accumulated, what I have accomplished in this life, what I, the kingdom and empire that I have built up. But Jesus says, hey, is this what your life is about? Hey, a man's life consists of, it's not about the things, the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. 
I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So this is somebody who is spending his life accumulating wealth, and he realizes, hey, I've filled all my bank accounts, right? I've filled all my barns. What am I going to do now? Well, I'm going to break those down and build even greater, right? It's like your house already gets full, so you go, hey, what do I do now when my house is full? Well, I'm going to build a new house, build an even bigger house to fill it with even more stuff. And I will say to my soul, look at him, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Isn't this what a lot of people work for, right? They work for their retirement. So that one day they can sit back and go, take thine ease. Eat, drink, travel around, see the world, enjoy the sights, enjoy the food, and be merry and be happy. Verse 20. But God said unto him, thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? What is he saying here? He's saying, well then, who, where, are all you, where is all your wealth going to go? Who is it going to go to? Now listen to this, 21. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself. Look at this. And is not rich toward God. So what is he saying here? He's saying, if you are the person that is laying up treasures on earth and not his heaven... So is he, so is he what? The fool. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. And the verse 21 says, so is he. Right? The rich fool that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So we think we have all the time in the world. Don't we? When you're young, especially, you just think, you know, people don't even think about death because they think, hey, I'm going to live forever. I've got so much time ahead of me. That's if you live to the life expectancy of 70, 80, or 90. But what if your life ends early? All of us know somebody who's been in some freak accident, or all of a sudden they, they went to sleep, they didn't wake up, you know? Sometimes I, I scare myself, I'm driving, you're tired, you didn't get enough sleep. What if you just doze off? And then your, your car goes, so many people going into car accidents that we don't even know about. There are people entering into eternity every single day. What if you go earlier? How much time do you really have? Now my second point, as I want you to think about, is you only have one life. You only get one chance at life, don't you? We don't have reincarnation where you keep coming back. There is one life to live. And that's why when you think about that chart of your weeks or even your years, every Sunday that you come to church, one of those boxes is gone. And that means one of those boxes that is gone is a box that you can never, ever get back because you only have one life to live. Hebrews 9, look at this. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So it's not appointed unto men twice to die, three, three times to die, infinite amount of times to die like the reincarnation believers which have you believe? No, the Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die. So if you die once, that means you only get to live once physically in this life. Right? So how are you going to spend that life? So when you realize and when you reflect on those charts that I showed you and you think, man, my life can be present presented by just a number of dots, a number of squares, and I'm constantly, every day, Losing one of those squares, is that going to change the way you live? I hope it does. I hope you realize life is so short and you don't waste your life. Think about how much time we waste. Think about how much vain things we do, how much time we just spend sitting down. Maybe you get home, you sit down in front of the TV, and you don't even realize how many hours have gone. You know, wasting time, doing vain things in our life. This is time gone. They can never be replaced. You'll never get that time back. That's why time is the most precious resource you have. Because you can use your time to make more money, right? More, depending on how productive you have, how productive you are. But once you use up your time, that time can never be replaced. So if you thought more on this, maybe you would live your life differently. If you thought more about how brief life is. Second Peter 3. Look what it says here. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, 
and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So I just want you to take note there, these works that are being burned up. So it's saying, hey, one day Jesus is going to return. There's going to be the thousand year reign. And one day heaven and earth shall pass away. I always wonder if that's what the day of the Lord is referring to, is that thousand year reign. Because the verse before this says the day is with the Lord, a thousand years. And a thousand years is as a day. And I just wonder if it's coincidental that there's a it's saying, hey, day of the Lord is a thousand years. And then it says, hey, in the day of the Lord, all these things are going to pass away. But yet that happens at the end of the thousand year reign. So I wonder if the day of the Lord is actually that thousand years when he returns. The day of the Lord is referring to his return, the setting up of the millennial kingdom, and at the end of that millennial kingdom, which is a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, there's the, the white throne judgment where everything will be disappeared. Right? All the works that are therein shall be burned up. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. One day, all things are going to be gone. Not only will one day your life be over, but even if you live till the end of the millennial kingdom, you know, when Jesus Christ returns, hey, all our physical things will be gone. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But Jesus says, my words shall not pass away. Look here in verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? See, if you reflect on the fact that the abundance in your life or the physical possessions that you own will one day be gone, that will change the way you live. And, and likewise, if you realize that one day the, the abundance of time that you believe you have will one day be gone, that will make you change the way you live as well. That's why the Bible says it's, so, it's, it's, it's better to be at the day of death, right? In the day of feasting, right? Because why? Because when you look, when you go to a funeral, when you go to the place of mourning, you're reminded of the fragility of life. You think about, wait, what, how are people going to remember me? What am I going to use my life for? And the Bible actually says, hey, it's better for you to dwell at the house of mourning and to reflect on that, to reflect on how you use your life than to be at the house of feasting. Why? Because when things are going well, when you're, when you're living it up and you're enjoying things, you're not thinking about death. You're not thinking about how short your life is. You're not thinking about what you're going to do for eternity. You're distracted. You're amused. But yet, when you go to the, when you, have, when you think about the day of death, you think about the place of mourning, that makes you reflect on eternal things and on spiritual things. And likewise, that's what this is saying. If you reflect on the fact that everything's going to be gone, one day your life will be over. One day, all the things that you've spent your life your blood sweat and tears to work for will all be gone what will be left what will withstand that fire in the last day when all your works are tried and burnt up and when you think about these things seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness what is it saying here what type of person should you be knowing that one day all these things will be gone one day your life will be over and my last point is there are two ways to live and we're giving these two ways to live in first corinthians 3. two ways you can spend your life all right when we think about the number of weeks you have the finite number of weeks you have in your life how can you use them well, in 1 Corinthians 3, we're told two different ways you can build this analogy of your life on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So this is obviously only applicable to saved people, because unsaved people have not even laid the foundation of their house. That's why the Bible would describe that as building your house on sand. You know, it's going to be fall, and great is the fall of it. But you build your house on the rock, that foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. So other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And this tells us as well, hey, there's only one foundation. There's only one way to heaven. Right? There's not other ways to heaven. There's one way to heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only foundation. There's no other foundation but Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation 
gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Now what are the two different ways you can live your life? Now if you notice here, there are two types, there are two categories of items here. Gold, silver, and precious stones, and then you have wood, hay, and stubble. Now what's the difference between these materials? Three of these materials can abide the fire. So when you build your house on this foundation, you build uh, your works on this foundation, you can either build gold, silver, and precious stone, which can abide the fire, or you're going to put on there what? Wood, hay, and stubble. So what are these things? These are things that well, the fire will destroy, right? and the fire it will not abide the fire. So what is the analogy that is given here? You can build on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and you can either build things of eternal value or you can build things of temporary value, right? The temporary, the physical, the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen are eternal. So what is, it, what is really, when you think about this, what really is the gold, silver, and precious stones? Because if it's nothing physical, what is it? Well, it's the people, isn't it? Because what's going to abide the fire at the end of the day? It's going to be the souls that we win to Jesus Christ. It's going to be the people that let the people, how we have contributed to winning souls to Jesus Christ, that is the gold, silver, and the precious stones. It's really nothing else. Because everything we do, what, what are we trying to aim towards? See, when we give money to something, why do we want to give money to a certain organization or a ministry? Because it's something that is helping to win souls, helping to build people up in the Lord, right? Or when we do good works, why are we trying to encourage one another? Because ultimately we want to love one another so we are a more effective body to reach more souls. That's the whole idea of this organization. The whole idea of the church is to be reaching people, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is the reward the people that we win to the Lord Jesus Christ, either directly or who we influence or who we support to do it. The other ones, wood, hay and stubble, what's that? That's our career aspirations, job, house, boat, bikes, motorbikes, cars, everything you amass, land. That's the wood, hay and stubble. Why? Because one day all that will be gone like we read in Peter. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, I've just underlined the word work here all the time, because notice what is being tried here by the fire. It is the man's work that is being tried. It is not the man himself. Because a lot of people, they will use this passage to, to try and teach that people go through a purgatory. Right? You go to purgatory and then you yourself are burnt, your sins are burnt off in order for you to enter heaven. But this passage is not talking about somebody burning in purgatory. Purgatory is not a biblical doctrine. What is this talking about? This passage is talking about the man's work being tried by fire. So you notice the difference. Purgatory is the man himself being burnt and his sins are being purged. But what is being burnt here in 1 Corinthians 3? It's the man's work, not his sin. So this is, this is the stuff that we accumulate or the things that we do in our lives. It shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet so as by fire. So notice here, man's work shall be burned, but even if you lose all your works, look at what happens. He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Why? Because the foundation cannot be burnt away. So it's very important. I'm pretty sure this is one of the main passages, especially for the Orthodox and for the Catholics, when they talk about, hey, purgatory and being burnt. But notice here, it's very clear, it is the man's work being burnt, not the man himself for his sins. So when you think about how you are building your life, what are you putting on that foundation? I mean, hopefully everyone here is saved. But once we're saved, how are we building on this foundation? Are we building 
the gold, silver and the precious stones or are we building wood, hay and stubble? Man, now if you reflect on your life, you reflect on the number and the finite number of weeks you have in your life, the weeks you have left, how are you using each week? If we were to colour this green and red and say green is when you used a week where, say, you, you built gold, silver and precious stones and maybe red was a week where you just built wood, hay and stubble. What would your chart look like? How much red and how much green would be on there? And when you think about how much time you have in your life, how much time you have left, do we really have time for wood, hay and stubble? You know, what will your life be? How will you colour in these dots that are left? So if you think about the year that's just gone by, this is a bit of a shorter sermon this morning because I just really wanted to drill this point home of the brevity of life and how this year is already gone. Five years of our church already gone. And when you think about just the last year in your life, how many times did you come to church in the last year? I mean, how many times did you skip church? We only really meet for church 52 times in the year. I always tell people, man, if you don't come to church for one week, you know, that's two weeks since you've been to church. If you miss church for three weeks, you know, that's one whole month you haven't been to church. And if you only come to church once a month, that's 12 times in the year you've come to church. 12 times. You can almost count. If you only come to church once a month, that is 12 times. In the year. You can almost count that on your fingers. Don't you think God deserves better than that? You know, that's why I think once a week is really the, the minimum. You know, just, just expecting people to come to church once a week. How many times did you come to church in the last year? How many times did you skip church? When you think about, did you contribute anything to the church this year? I'm not talking about financially. I'm not talking about the work. Did you take, did you have somebody over for dinner this year? How many times did you stay for lunch and encourage somebody else? How many times did you stay at church and talk about somebody else's life rather than your own? Or how many times did you do something for the church? Either help set up, you know, be here early to greet people, stay late to help pack up. If you didn't do anything in that whole year, man, a whole year just passed and you haven't contributed anything to the church or to the work of God this year. What about how much Bible you read in this past year? Do you sometimes reflect on how much Bible you read? Maybe you didn't even pick up the Bible once in the whole last year. Man, shame on you if you did not even read your Bible once. And I don't mean, you know, you come to church, you read the scripture on the, on the PowerPoint, and you say, hey, I'm reading my Bible because I read one chapter every week at church. I mean, you in your own personal time, between you and the Lord, you sat down, with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God teaching you directly through the Word. How many times? Can you count on your hands the number of times you did that? Man, how, many, how ashamed should we feel if you can count the number of times you sat down with the Word of God and you read the Bible between you and God? How much Bible did you read? What about your prayer life? What about your prayer life? Did you pray for somebody this year? Did you pray for anybody this year? Or did you live your whole life not even thinking about anybody else? Did you pray for anyone in this last year? What about soul winning in this past year? Soul winning. Did you go soul winning once this year? Man, a whole year has passed. Did you go soul winning once? Even if you didn't come soul winning with the church, do you remember the last time you shared the gospel with somebody else? And if you think about the last time you shared the gospel with somebody else, you didn't even do it in the last year. Man, shame on you. I, Paul says, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Man, when we think about, that's why, hey, that's why I really like the end of the year. It makes you think about how you're going to spend the next year. It also makes you reflect on the year gone by. Hopefully not make the same mistakes that you did in the previous year. What did you do of eternal significance this year?
Can you look back at your last year of life and think, man, I did something for the Lord. I contributed to eternity. I did something of eternal significance. I put some gold, silver, and precious stone on my foundation. Or when you look back at the last year, do you just see wood, hay, and stubble? Man, I don't want to get to the end of my life and realize all I had on the day of judgment is wood, hay, and stubble on my foundation. I want to make sure I've got some gold, silver, and precious stone. So think about this, guys. We're at the end of one year already uh, as being in, being, being in Liverpool. right? This is the fifth end of year we've uh, we've experienced since start, or well, the fourth end, fourth last year since starting the church. If you don't do anything different, if you don't change anything, we're going to be here one year later thinking the exact same thing. Whatever you're thinking today, and you're thinking, man, I should have done this this year, I should have done something different. If you don't change anything, when we get to the end of next year, it's going to be the exact same. And you're going to be thinking the same thing. How quickly the year has gone, but another year would have gone. And you don't change anything, a year is going to go again, and you're going to think, man, that year went so quick, until one day you're going to run out of boxes to tick. So think about the excuses people make when they don't serve God. First of all, you start off too young. People say, oh, I'm too young to serve God. And then life starts. You go to work, you get married, you have children, you have your career, you have your aspirations, and now in this whole period, what do people say? Too busy. Too busy to serve God. So start, start off too young, make that excuse, too busy, and then what happens when you retire? Then people say, now I'm too old to serve God. Leave that for the young ones. And then what happens? Then you're too dead. <laughs> too young, too busy, too old, and then before you know it, you're too dead to serve the Lord. Now, oh man, you've got to get busy serving God. We've got to stop. You know, it's time to stop making excuses. Otherwise, one day, you'll have no time left. So I just want you to reflect on that truth today. That life is so short. Like the Bible says, man, life is a vapor. It appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. So what is your life? What are you going to do with your life? How are you going to build on that foundation? Gold, silver, and precious stones? Are you going to do something to win people to the Lord and have some gold, silver, and precious stone on that foundation? Or are you going to spend your life building wood, hay, and stubble? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, short lesson this morning, Lord, but I just wanted to remind the people here of the, the brevity of life. I pray, Lord, that your word will speak to their hearts, Lord, that, that it will light a fire in them for the new year. And Lord, we don't think about even next year. I mean, today we can make a difference today. Uh, we have soul winning this afternoon. Lord, we can make a difference today. Go out and preach the gospel even before the year is ended. So I just pray, Lord, that you'll help this church uh, to always do what they can do now, Lord, to realize we don't have a lot of time left. And Lord, to use our life to serve you and to live for you. Put as much gold, silver, and precious stone on that foundation as we can. So we thank you, Lord. Uh, we need your grace to not waste our time day in and day out. Help us to make sure we are productive for the kingdom of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.